Good evening, everybody. We are so glad you could be with us tonight for a very important and timely event. My name is Charlene Margo, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of The Parent Venture, a nonprofit organization that brings inclusive, high-quality parent education to the community. Um, I founded the program you see behind me, the Parent Education Series, 16 years ago, and we've now had close to 100,000 attendees, so we are delighted to have you all with us tonight for a really very important topic, fighting hate for good and anti-bias community training. We are thrilled to have with us Samantha Brown, who is the Education Director for the Anti-Defamation League. I'm going to be telling you more about her in just a few minutes. Uh, first of all, though, if you need Spanish interpretation tonight, we have with us Cynthia Hinesterosa, who will be doing the live interpretation. In the Zoom chat, you will see instructions in Spanish for how to click on the globe icon and then Spanish again if you need Spanish interpretation. Thank you, Cynthia. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors who are so important to the production of this program. So many thanks to the Sequoia Union High School District, the Sequoia Healthcare District, Peninsula Healthcare District, and nonprofit, The Parent Venture. We would not be here without you. Uh, again, the topic is important and the time is right to be having this conversation, especially this fall with kids heading back to school. So tonight we're going to do about 35, 30, 35 minutes of content with Samantha Brown, and then I'll be joining her for some Q&A. But we really want to hear from you, the audience. So this is a webinar format with audience engagement. So if you have comments for us, please put that in the chat. Questions, if you could put in the Q&A button. So I will be checking, and my partner, Bev Hartman, will be checking the chat, and then Q&A for questions. If you can keep your questions kind of brief, we'd like to get as many of them as possible answered tonight, and we will be answering your questions throughout the evening. So please feel free to ask them as they come up, okay? Uh, again, at the end of the program, in the chat, you will see a link to a survey from the Parent Education Series. We hope you will take just a minute to let us know how you think about this program. Your Input is important to us and helps us with future planning for parent education events. Tonight's event is being recorded and will be available soon on our video library YouTube channel. The channel has had more than 27,000 views, including 15,000 this year. So we know that many of you who are attending tonight may want to rewatch or share with a spouse, a partner, one of your children. So again, that will be available. The video library is free and has more than 120 videos of parent and community education programs. All right, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's keynote presenter. Samantha Brown is an educator and social justice advocate working to address inequities that affect social and academic outcomes for communities of color, formerly incarcerated and immigrant populations. She earned her BA in sociology and MA in education with a concentration in equity and social justice. Samantha currently serves as the Education Director at the Anti-Defamation League Central Pacific Region, where she directs their K-12 school climate initiative, No Place for Hate. This initiative provides anti-bias programming for students, administrators, and community members throughout the region, and it focuses on promoting equity, inclusion, and allyship by examining and confronting issues of bias to disrupt hate as well as providing educational support, resources, and consultation. We are very fortunate to have with us tonight, Samantha Brown from ADL. Thank you, Samantha, take it away. Thank you, Charlene. I appreciate the invite um, and I appreciate being here to have this important conversation. Um, so for those of you who don't know ADL um, or maybe new to ADL, education is very foundational to the work that we do um, at ADL. And so we are very, um, very invested in making sure that families, educators, um, community members have the tools that they need to have important conversations like this and really work to um, address bias and disrupt it to stop the escalation of hate. And so um, Charlene, I guess you'll go ahead and get us started. Yes, Bev, why don't we share slides? Hang on, we're gonna go back to the beginning.
Okay, again, the title for tonight's conversation is Fighting Hate for Good and Anti-Bias Community Training. You can go to the next. You can skip ahead. Thank you. So why are we having this important conversation? Um, why do we need to talk about bias? Why do we need to talk about um, the way in which we show up in the world? And so, um, you know, the simple answer is that bias is universal, right? It is bias is universal in the way that we develop, experience, and perpetuate it. Um, like at some point. So we all are receiving hundreds of cues of social cues every day. We're getting a ton of information, right? That really um, shapes how we look at the world, how we show up in the world, how we treat others. And so it's really imperative to unpack, right? Where our biases come from um, and the impact that it continues to have interpersonally and institutionally. And so the way that we do this at ADL is through our four pillars of anti-bias education. And the first pillar um, focuses on identity, really exploring identity. So taking time to think about ourselves, right, and processing. It's what, um, what Dr. Dina Simmons um, would call vigilant self-awareness, right, which means acknowledging who we are and our power and privilege in that. And then understanding the need, the necessity um, to be aware of that privilege, to be aware of that power, to be aware of who we are and what impact that has on ourselves and others, right? So saying to myself that, you know, the fact that I am an oldest daughter, you know, raised by um, two, raised by a single parent um, in an in inner city neighborhood um, around extended family, that I identify as a woman, that I identify as a black woman, assessing all those things and understanding, right, how that impacts my, um, you know, my ability to show up for myself and show up for others. And so, you know, we kind of tend to do a thing um, with other people called othering, right? We tend to think about ourselves as normal and who we are, right? And I bet like, you know, when we, when we see people, we're already developing a story about them. We're already deciding where they come from, their identity, et cetera. But we really need to start to talk about our differences and understand our differences. And so the importance of really interpreting differences in the world is really to help us understand like the historical context and the ex experience of other people um, in this country as a result of systemic bias and oppression. And that's really important because we kind of tend to do this thing that it's kind of me versus them, right? Or my bias against yours. And so what we need to understand really is the interconnectedness of our stories and the interconnectedness of our shared experiences um, our shared experiences with bias, our shared experiences um, with oppression, et cetera. And so in that, we should also be thinking about how do we then actively challenge bias in ourselves as a lifelong practice? How do we become intentional about recognizing who we are, right? The lens through which we see the world and then how that impacts who we are, right? How we treat others, the decisions that we make that also impacts others and being able real, realistically, right, to do that on a continuous basis. And we know that it's hard. We know that it's not easy. We know that it's uncomfortable, but it's necessary. And realistically, we know that this doesn't necessarily happen in this order, right? I think ideally we'd like to say that, yes, I'm so self-aware that now I can see bias in myself and now I can talk about it um, with others and talk about it um, interpersonally. And now I can call it out in institutions and demand change. But we know that it kind of happens like in a backwards way, right? It's easier to point out others' biases because a lot of times we're on the receiving end of that or a bias that we see through institutions because we're experiencing that as a, as a result of who we are, right? And that's okay. But the main goal is to become aware of it and challenge it. And the last part of the anti-bias pillar or the fourth pillar is about actively challenging bias um, in our, is about, I'm sorry, rewind, um, is about championing justice. Um, so in reality, right, we're still figuring this out. We're still figuring out what justice looks like because as our, as our society evolves, as we go through ebbs and flows, right, what is just at the moment may not be just in the future. Right, and so we have to be willing um, to continue to advocate for ourselves and others so that we create policies and systems that make 
society safe, safe physically, safe emotionally, and really equitable and inclusive for us all. And so through these four pillars, you know, we are able to begin to kind of unpack, right, a lot of different things that really, um, you know, perpetu help perpetuate systems of oppression. And so when folks kind of say to us, you know, well, you know, that's good, that's great. Why not anti-racist education? Why not SEL? The thing about anti-bias education is that it talks about that all, right? It makes space for all those conversations. And we don't say that, you know, one conversation or one perspective is important over the other, but that we need to talk about it all, right? And then we need to talk about the oppression, the bias that happens based on all identities, right? Whether it's gender, um, whether it's socioeconomic status, whether it's race, it's race, ethnicity, religious identity, et cetera. Next. So this is the tool uh, we use called the Pyramid of Hate. And the purpose of the Pyramid of Hate really is to show how biased behavior um, growing in complexity from, from bottom to top, um, you know, really starts to escalate if we don't address our bias, right? And so although the behaviors are each at each level neg negatively impact individuals and groups, right? As one moves up the pyramid, we see that it becomes more life-threatening and some people will say well this is extreme right we we have genocide at the top like it's not going to get to that but we know in some of our lifetimes like we've seen that we know around the world that this is happening right and so we have to start to think about how do i show up right when i'm thinking about biased behaviors and attitude am i stepping up and am i acknowledging that and I'm, am i disrupting that or am i normalizing it and the pyramid is not designed to suggest like a ranking um, of how serious each level is, right? Or how serious each behavior is, but it's rather, it really helps us demonstrate that when people accept like one level of this behavior, it becomes either easier to, beset, to accept other levels of the behavior as normal. And so, you know, as we go up this pyramid, right, let's talk about, let's kind of get into this pyramid and talk a little bit about um, the different levels of this pyramid and challenge, um, you know, the, the things in here. And so at the first one, we see biased attitudes and behavior, right? We see things like stereotyping. We see things like fear of differences, justifying biases by seeking out like-minded people, right? So kind of what we call sometimes preaching to the choir, those who are going to validate and affirm, right? And sometimes it's family, sometimes it's friends, right? It tends to be our in-group, right? And then lack of self-awareness or reflection um, of privilege, right? And how that impacts others or our power and how that impacts others, right? Because if we don't acknowledge that, right, then we may harm others or we may fail to leverage it. So there's a responsibility there. At the second level, we see acts of bias as non-inclusive language, right? So we often don't think about, especially when we're working with young people, right? And even with each other, the things that we say and the implications of that language, right? When we think about, um, you know, how we talk about, um, you know, other groups of people. And it's not to say that we are doing this intentionally, but it's learned, right? It's a part of the way we communicate with each other. We talk about other people and we talk about things, right? In terms of colors, for example, right? And we can say that when we hear things um, that start with the term black, right? We think, oh my gosh, then that's bad, right? Black death, right? Black, black plague, right? I'm feeling dark or this is dark. And so we have to think about what messages that is sending to our children. Because even though at home, maybe, you know, some folks in their homes don't talk about race, some people in their homes really, um, you know, try to champion multiculturalism, you know, and say things like, I don't see skin color, you know, it's, it doesn't really impact us. But the reality of the situation, right, is we are living in a society where we have been categorized according to race, right, we've been racialized, all of us, right, we've been categorized according to our gender, We've been categorized according to our socioeconomic status. We've been categorized um, based on our citizenship, right? And so those things have an impact. We see bias and belittling jokes, right? And so again, in our in-groups, like right, things that people say, right? And we think, oh, they didn't mean it, but we don't know that they didn't mean that, right? And we don't know 
how that might manifest into X behavior. You know, we see cultural appropriation, right? So borrowing cultures from other folks and not appreciating, right, where that culture comes from, the historical context of it, and the struggle that folks had to go through, right? And so we kind of get into that when we think about diversity. And I know diversity is a wonderful thing, but sometimes we lose, right, the purpose really of diversity. And so when, I th when we talk about diversity, when we talk about champion diversity, right, we want to think about it as like, if we are creating an equitable and inclusive environment, then we'll have diversity, right? And we'll have sustainable diversity. That's just going to happen, right? Not the other way around, that we build diversity or we get diversity, and then we work on equity and inclusion. And so we need to think of, you know, including people and challenging bias as a foundational step as we think about building community. And so at home, right, if we are thinking about how we show up in front of our children, right, our, our children are watching the things that we do every single day. They're watching how we look at the neighbor, right? They're watching how we react to news stories or the things that we say, you know, about things happening on the news alongside us. And so we have to remember sometimes that even though we say X, right, we're doing Y. And we have a responsibility, especially for young people, to really give them a space to, to kind of um, examine what's happening and to talk to them about it and to talk to, their, talk to them about their feelings about it. Charlene, did you have a question? I saw you unmute yourself. Yeah, you know, we talked about the title for this presentation, Samantha. And could you tell us just a little bit about what you mean at ADL by fighting hate for good? Absolutely, absolutely. And so when we are thinking about um, disrupting bias, that's what we mean by fighting hate for good. So disrupting bias to stop the escalation of hate is kind of a tagline that we have. But fighting hate for good means that we are fighting so that we can create the kind of socially just society that we want to see that creates conditions that are better for all of us. Right. And so when we think of, you know, fighting, some people think get a violent picture. Some people think, oh, we don't want to fight. Right. We don't want to have confrontation. But we think of it as a necessary process. Right. To get to the point where we can have a society that we are all safe emotionally and physically in. Thank you for that. I think that that phrase could be a really good conversation starter with children of any age. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as we're thinking about, right, as we're thinking about young people and how they develop sense of self, right, again, going back to the pyramid and imagining, right, who they are, right, who we are in this world and how our children perceive that. Because a lot of times we decide for our children who they are, right? We decide how they're going to show up. We decide how their people are going to treat them. And we don't really ask them, who do you feel like you are? right? How do you see the world? How have you been treated? And those are the things that we, the conversations that we need to start having, because in those conversations, we will start, we will start to find, right, that, that children are thinking about this, right? When they enter schools, they see difference, and that's okay, but we can't ignore it. And so as they're developing a sense of self, right, like for young children, young children don't have necessarily the capacity to think about, you know, their past, present, and future self whereas adolescents do. And so for young children, it is about helping them develop a healthy sense of who they are, right, and who others are. So telling, exposing them, right, to other stories, exposing them to other, to the experiences or explaining the other experiences or the other challenges of, you know, their peers who may have different identities. And that is really, really important. Because the ideology that we adopt from our parents, you know, from our communities, from our religious group, um, you know, from our gender group, if not, you know, if they are turn into stereotypes, then they will develop into prejudice. And this is dangerous. This is dangerous because that's what then we act upon. So we need to be thinking about how young people are seeing our attitude or interpreting our attitudes and behaviors towards others. Right. And then how they're thinking about, right, even working through, again, interpreting those differences. Right. And then challenging when it doesn't feel good, challenging, you know, when they are treated like they are the other. Next. 
So when we talk about bias, right, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty simplified conversation, I think. Um, and most folks will probably say like, I don't like, I get it, you know, explicit or implicit bias. We don't need to talk about this. Um, we talked about this enough. Um, but it's really important to understand bias and how it shows up in its function. And so there's been the argument, right, against like, well, if it's explicit, you know, it's more harmful. If it's implicit, it's less harmful. Or using the excuse that, mm, well, I didn't know, right? It's implicit bias. And so it only takes a minute for that awareness to kick in, right? And at that minute, you have the opportunity to make a choice, right? Either you're going to act on that bias or you're not. But the thing that folks need to realize is that whether implicit or explicit, right, it has an impact. And we don't know what that impact is really, right, unless someone shares with us, right? We don't know what those words did. We don't know what that look did, right? We don't know what that language did, what that attitude did, or that feeling of exclusion did, right? And so we need to, when we're thinking about who we are, when we're thinking about who, we, who our children are, really need to be thinking about it also in terms of intersectionality, right? And thinking about how we, right, examining, um, you know, overlapping and connected social systems and how the compounding oppression impacts people, right? And so because we're a multifaceted, so for example, I am, I named various identities, right? And so not only is your, is your daughter or son, right, a daughter or son, right? They might identify with a certain religious group, right? They might identify with a certain culture or ethnic group. And so many times folks are really experiencing bias on multiple levels, right? We may see it as one way. We may see it as like, oh, well, you know, they don't have to worry about this or they don't have to worry about that, but it's more complex than that. And so understanding the context of bias and really how to talk about bias is important, right? Because we talk about bias, we're, we're, how we should be talking about bias really is, is as cognitive bias because bias shows up in a lot of different ways. And so as we were talking about, right, with, with the pyramid, there's confirmation bias, right? That bias that we get when we are around others who believe the same thing that we do. Right, there's something called halo bias in which we see a person or a certain group of people and we decide these people are good, right? They have good values and so they are not capable of X, right? There's hindsight bias. There's, there's where you remember things a certain way, right? And then begin to act according to your expectation, whether valid or not, right? And we know that our remembering is not necessarily what actually happened. And then there's like self-serving bias, right? In which we are telling a story, right? That seeks to elevate us or seeks to put us in a light where we are the positive influence, right? Where we are um, the person who is being offended, but not the offender. And so we have to think about that. And we really have to dig deep when we are thinking about bias and how it shows up because we communicate these things to our children, right? When, we, when situations occur, they're looking at how is my guardian, how is my teacher going to react? How's my mom and dad going to react? How, how is my grandma and grandpa, the people that I trust, how are they going to react to this situation, right? And then they feel like they should do as such. And so we need to be accountable and we need to be intentional, right? And so we need to think about this as a human experience, Right. Um, scholar and educator um, Loretta Ross says that she likes to say that she is a humanist. Right. And not to say that it's not important to look at race. It's not important to look at gender. It's not important to look at religious identity. It is. It absolutely is. But what we need to but what we fail to realize a lot of times is the human experience that we are all having. And so bias shows up many times when we fail to really just allow people the dignity, right, that they need and that they deserve as human beings. Charlene, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, Samantha, for some folks who have just joined us recently, you talked about people who say, you know, we don't, and many parents feel this, they say, we don't see race. We brought up our kids to be colorblind. But you've said that that's really not that's really not the lane that we should be in. Can you explain a little bit more about what that means, why we do need to talk about race? 
Yeah, we need to talk about race. We need to talk about identity because it is the way in which we are judged, right? In society, it is the way that we are classified on so many on so many levels, right? And so also because if not, we're ignoring an experience, right? We're ignoring a story, right? Of X group of people, and so it's okay to again recognize difference and then talk about the story. Right. Talk about who who are these group of people? Who are we? Um, you know, author Kelly Yang, who's um, wrote the book Front Desk, talked about how um, she really started writing for her children because as she got older and she was talking with her with her small children, she realized that they really didn't know like who she was in her story. And so then she realized, like, oh, my gosh, you know, I have been teaching them to, you know, show up in the world and be fair and be kind and dot, dot, dot. Right, but I really haven't even told them my story. So if you don't know your own story, right, how can you appreciate that of others? And so that's what we mean when, you know, it's it's not enough not to talk about color, right? It's not enough not to talk about different genders, right? It's not enough to not talk about different religions because that is what your children will experience as they grow up in the world. And how can we expect them to be responsible adults, right? How can we um, expect them to exercise a certain level of civility that we like to see, right? When we haven't taught them how to interact with folks who have differences in a respectful and dignified way. And so next slide. So one of the things that I think is, is really kind of looming um, amongst all of us is fear, right? Fear and, um, kind of the, the kind of denial really, and that we don't wanna talk about what the problem is or, right, we don't wanna acknowledge how big the problem is. And so we have been thrust into, right, because of a pandemic, kind of a really, really unique space where we are spending a lot of time not really interacting interpersonally, right? We're interacting online, um, we're interacting on social media and other platforms, and so, that makes for a certain dynamic, but what's not changed is a level is the bias that people have against each other and misunderstanding. And that really does manifest itself um, online. It really does manifest itself in a way that's harmful. And so when we are thinking about disrupting bias with our children, we really have to know the impact of the problem, right? And sometimes it's, it's out of ignorance, right? That we're not able to speak to certain things right, because in our world, right, maybe because we're not exposed to um, this, that, and the other, we don't understand, right, the suffering of other people. We don't understand what's happening in the world. And so we are facing um, a huge challenge, a huge challenge. We spend most of our time online, adults and student and, and young people alike. And so in this report um, that ADL did on online hate and harassment um, in 2020, um, we found that there was a huge increase in hate and harassment, um, you know, for LGBT, LGB, LGBTQ plus respondents reported higher rates of overall harassment um, than all other demographics, like for the third consecutive year at like 64%. 36% um, of Jewish respondents experienced online harassment comparable to 33% last year. Asian American respondents have experienced the largest single year over year rise in severe online harassment in comparison to other groups, right? With 17% reporting this year compared to 11% last year. And then African-American respondents reported a sharp rise in race-based harassment from 42% last year to 59% this year. And so what does that tell us, right? What does that tell us? It's important to know the numbers, right? We saw, right, with COVID, a, a lot of things happening, right? We saw with, um, COVID scapegoating, we saw a rise in xenophobia or anti-immigrant bias. We saw um, you know, racism against folks racialized as Asian or perceived as Asian Pacific Islander, right? We saw in the face of injustice, we saw a rise in hate against African-Americans, LGBTQ, pretty much every single group, right? And I like to, you know, I, I not joke, but say to folks in my world, I don't have one person in my life that is not impacted by this, 
that does not fit into one of these categories, right? And so we're not exempt. And so we have to start to think about, right, the impact of this problem because it didn't just happen. We know that it didn't just explode all of a sudden because of who was in office. It didn't explode because of George Floyd, because of Breonna Taylor. We know that this has been the way in which, right, we have been building up. We've been building up to this, right, in our society. And so we have to begin to think about this. And again, how this trickles down, right? Then what if we are seeing this, if we're experiencing this, what are our young people seeing? And so this is telling why, why we see the behavior that we do from students. I've heard from principals this year that they've seen increased fights. I've heard from my niece, right, who just entered junior high that she's seen increased fights and that people don't know how to talk to each other, right? But we have this bullying going on. They're imitating what they see and they're imitating what they hear, right, without very little context. Because again, right, we're having these conversations, we're acting out in these ways, we're affirming these beliefs without having conversations with our young people. And I think without necessarily fully understanding them ourselves and not being willing to ask the questions, to sit in that discomfort, to challenge our own bias around things that we um, don't like. And so, you know, our young people are trying to find, right, a connection. They're trying to find justification you know, for why things are the way that they are, right? And why they're not right. Because one thing is that they know when things aren't right, right? There's something very pure about young people and that they are able to call out, right? When things are not safe, when things are not good, right? Because they feel it. And they have not yet learned to, like many adults, ignore that feeling, right? And so as a result, they, have, they call it out. And so when we think about this, right, it's not to scare anybody, it's not to say, oh, let's just throw a whole bunch of statistics on the page and talk about how bad the world is. Like, again, this is not new stuff, but it's the reality that we're living in. And if we don't get, a, get out of our own space, then we may never know these things. We may never know the multiple levels on which people are experiencing hate, right, or being victimized. And this is showing up in real life, right? And so in, in the, the FBI every year um, publishes a hate crime statistics report, and they found in that report, a six, they, they reported in that a 6% increase in hate crimes from previous years. And that's the highest total in 12 years. So we have to start thinking about this, like, you know what, I can do something, I have to do something. Right, because people who we tend to have this idea that like the people, the bullies, the people who are being hateful, the people who are being biased don't look like us, right? That they don't sound like us, that they don't believe like us. But many of the times they do, right? And so that's why we need to start talking about this. This is why we need to start addressing it first in ourselves, right? And then um, in others and in institutions. Next. And so the ideologies and attitudes that, you know, young people adopt really as adolescents impact us or impact them through their lives, right? So if we think about, we think back to adolescence and we think about the values that we had um, and how those matured, how those progress, you know, we can think about, you know, how that has played out in our lives. And so if we look at this slide and we think about the previous slide, right, we see some things that are really disturbing, right, about bullying. And we know that this is happening. We know that, you know, sometimes it is so hard um, to even address this, especially being in a virtual space. We know that many times, you know, folks will dismiss it and say, oh, kids are just being kids, right? And let's be real, like adults bully as well. And so we will do the same things, right? We'll dismiss it. We'll just say, oh, you're being too sensitive. Do we have to talk about this again? And the answer is yes, we have to talk about it because it's having real life impact, right? And real life consequences. And so if we think about our childhood, right? If we think about how we even received messages, right? On, on differences, how we came to understand who we are and again, examine, right? Who other people are. We can think about instances where maybe we've played various roles, right? Because as we all do, because we all at some point perpetuate bias. And so maybe in the situation that comes to mind, maybe we were a bystander, 
right? Maybe we were a target. Maybe we were an aggressor or an ally accomplice. And so I can remember for myself being very young, right? And spending time with an uncle and going to the store and seeing him stopped by police that was in the parking lot, having, car, having the car searched for no reason. And so for me, as a young person, that sent a specific message. So much so that one day I, in elementary school, I'd forgotten my lunch and I decided, well, I live close enough to, to school that I can walk home. And so I started to walk home and I just literally just left school and started to walk home. And an officer pulled up on the side of me because he sees this little girl walking home. And I would not stop until I got home because in my mind, if I gave that officer the chance, if I gave the police the chance, then I may not make it home, right? And so when we are, again, going through these things, we have to remember, right? We, we tend to say like, well, I'm acting this way for my kids. I'm saying this or making these decisions for my kids. But in reality, a lot of times we're making this as an, we're making those decisions based on our own experiences. And so we have to work that out for our children. Right, so we can shift the situation and shift the dialogue when these things happen. Charlene? You know, Samantha, this makes me think of when you and I were planning this event and I said to you, so how early do you think parents should start having the talk about race and racism and identity? And you said, that really depends. That if you are a black parent or a mixed race family, you're gonna be having a very different talk and much earlier. Could you comment on that? Absolutely, because it's out of necessity. It's out of necessity. And so, you know, my comment to Charlene was that, you know, for many folks, they are challenged and they will call and they'll ask like, well, I don't want to talk about race with my um, three-year-old or, or with my four-year-old or five-year-old or six-year-old. And some of us don't have the choice, right? Because we are raising young people that are impacted by this as soon as they walk through the doors of that classroom. And so we have to have these conversations because not having the conversation in the ignorance, right, could be life-threatening. And we've seen that, right? If we don't have conversations with our students about who they are and then how people could possibly perceive them, then we are doing them an injustice in some sense because we could be preparing them instead, right? And it's unfortunate that we have to think this way, but that's the reality right, of where we live. And so some of us have the privilege of not doing that, right? Some of us have the privilege of, you know, being able to think of other things, right, and not having to prepare our, our young people in the same way or have those same conversations. And yes, are the conversations scary? They are, right? Because who wants to hear or who wants to see, right, a child be fearful, Right? We want to know that young people have hope. We want to know that young people you know, are looking at and imagining their future and how they can make the world better. But it's a necessary conversation. If we don't have this conversation, then in reality, as they grow, they will not be making decisions. They will not be doing the things that they need to do to make the world a better place, which is what we're asking for. That was a great question, Charlene. Thank you. And so caring for our kids, right, and addressing the social emotional impact um, of bias and bias behaviors and attitudes is so critical because again, our young people are trying to make sense of the world. And I think, I mean, in reality, we can argue that we're still trying to make sense of the world, right? We're trying to figure out what, what is this? What is happening? This is not the world that many of us imagined, right? As we were even, as we were five, six, seven, 12, 18 years old, but this is the world that we have. And we know that again, right, the impact of being in a pandemic, right, seeing the rise of hate, seeing the victimization, right, of certain groups because of their perceived ethnicity, because of their perceived citizenship, you know, hearing um, derogatory things and seeing scapegoating um, and placing blame, right, on certain groups for even the pandemic itself, right, children are seeing all of that, they're taking in all of that. And so again, we really have to be careful what we say, right? Even if we think it, right? There might be times that we think things and we're kind of thinking it out loud, right? And that may be a moment that we need to stop and say, how is my child gonna perceive this, 
right? How is the young person around me going to perceive this, going to perceive my opinion? So yes, it is about, right, putting, putting their needs like before ours. And so, you know, the challenge of returning to this space, right, as we think about returning to shared space after a pandemic and interpreting differences and how we experience it is that, right, we've all been experiencing this kind of in our silos, right? We, we kind of have out of safety, right, but then also out of comfort, right, out of fear, out of a lot of different emotions have kind of siloed ourselves. And so we're not able to work out the things that we need to work out. Right, we're not able to see the intention or the emotion even behind the things that people say, and that can that itself can can lead to misunderstanding, right? And we've seen that consistently, Charlene. So I just wanted to share. There's a comment that came in the chat, Samantha, and I know you can relate to this. This parent says. This talk and resources are much needed at our schools and home. We have five multi-ethnic children, Hispanics and Japanese, and one child has already had three racial slurs incidents at her school. The sad part is that our school administrators are not doing enough work around DE&I, so thank you for that comment. What you're saying just rings so true, Samantha. Yeah, because we know it plays out on the schoolyard. Right. And I remember a place, um, naive as it may sound, right. I remember, I remember a time, excuse me, um, that school felt safe, right. That I, that I thought the school was a safe place. Right. And that's not the reality that our students are living in, right. They're living in, in the reality that of this, right. Of what we're seeing on the screen of being bullied, right. The constant threat of violence at schools, right. That if I say anything, if I stand up for myself, then that may result in, right, a, a really a terrible experience for not just me, but for everybody. And that's scary, that's scary. Charlene, did you have something to add? No, I just, I could, you know, you're doing a brilliant job laying everything out in a very concise way. So just keep going, Samantha. I have a million questions, but they can wait. <laughs> keep okay, going. All good, all good. And so when we think about this experience, right, we tend to think about our experiences, um, in terms of us and them versus collectivism. And for those of us, for many of our cultures, right, that is not, that's really not, um, really not, not the way in which we were taught, but it's the way in which, right, our American society kind of, kind of um, communicates how we should be, right, is this idea of individualism. And so we model that for our kids, right, we think about kids and we're like, oh my gosh, I have to well, so let me just let me just backtrack and say, like, I tend to be on the optimistic side and think that folks are going to get it right and they're going to do the right things. They're going to say the right things for the kids. Right. And in my mind, it's all kids, because when I'm working with students, I want to see them all win. I want to see them all healthy. I want to see them all safe. I don't care if it's the student that's being disrespectful. I don't care if it's the student that's having a bad day. I genuinely want them to win. But a friend told me recently nobody cares about those kids. And I laughed about it. But what she was really saying is that we, for many of us, right, we're thinking about our kids, right? And that's natural, right? We're thinking about their experience. We're thinking about what they need. We're thinking about, right, how they can be harmed. And that's, again, natural. But as educators and as parents, right, we need to be thinking about this collectively, because we're all having a collective experience, right? And so this idea of othering, this idea of saying that this is not, right, seeing slurs on, you know, graffiti or slurs out of school Y is not as bad as X, um, ignoring when incidents occur, like, oh, my language isn't that bad, or I didn't mean it that way, all those things, right, are doing us harm. And so we, again, need to start talking about those. And we need to start teaching students how to be civil to each other, right, how to establish respect and really demonstrate behaviors and attitudes that lead to equitable and inclusive schools. Because our young people know, right, they know what's happening. They know that, you know, if we don't treat each other in a certain way, right, if we have not modeled this, that there won't be any consequences. Right. And so we have to start thinking about that in terms of like, OK, when this happens, right, how do we bring students into the conversation? How do we, you know, open up a space for them so they can parse out all of the things that they're thinking, even if they disagree? 
right? We need to create that space for them so that this doesn't happen, so that they're not feeling so frustrated that they feel like they need to bully others, right? Because they can't express themselves or so that they're not being bullied and then feeling like they have no power, they have no sense of agency or so they're not being a bystander and seeing students being bullied, right? And walking by and saying, I'm just glad it's not me, right? So we have to begin again to shift, right? How we begin to address bias and think about bias and think about, right? These conversations um, around DEI or diversity, equity and inclusion in general, because they're important and they're necessary and we can't shy away from them. So true. And you know, again, when we're talking about bias with little kids and as this one parent comments here, it's not just about race. As she says, I'm seeing young kids, kindergarten, who think every kid must fit into a boy box or a girl box and they're not equipped to welcome a peer who doesn't fit neatly into one of these gender boxes. Absolutely. Schools can do more to help with this. So as you say, it's a big issue on so many levels. Yeah, it is a big issue on so many levels. And again, when we talk about anti-bias education, we talk about exploring identity, right? What I mentioned before about intersectionality speaks to all those things, right? Understanding, right? What, what role we play in the world because of gender, right? And how other people see us because of these gender boxes, right? Because of socioeconomics, because of citizenship, right, et cetera. And so again, right, we, when we are looking at, right, why people are bullied, we see that it's because of identity. It's because of things that we don't necessarily choose, right, but then we're penalized for it. So this is why we have to start having those conversations with our children at a young age, because again, they can be on the receiving end of it, but then they can also perpetuate it out of frustration or when they don't understand it. And those are the behaviors that we need to enter, that we need to disrupt. We really need to think about how we model the behavior that we wanna see in our young people, right? I hear people talk about um, young people in a ways that, you know, they don't care, they're disrespectful. Um, you know, they think they know everything. And I would argue that they know a lot, right? They know a lot about the world. They're taking it in just as we are. And so if you sit, if you take time to get to know and understand where the experience is coming from, they're just modeling what they see us do and how they see us react when we're frustrated, right? When we don't feel seen and heard. And we have to remember that. Next. So how do we have these conversations, right? What is, what is the best way to have those conversations? And I would say there is no necessarily best way I think one of the things that we have to begin to do is think about how do we educate our students about other folks' experience, right? So that they build empathy, so that they develop understanding and know that yes, they, they should be seen and they are seen and they are heard, but they should also see and hear others, right? And so we do what we call table talks, right? Talking at the table around the dinner table, right? Because that's the place in which many of us come together um, around food or et cetera. And so this is time for us to talk about the day, right? And maybe we already do this organically, right? How was your day? How did you, you know, what did you do at school, right? Who did you talk to? All of those things. And so this is also great opportunities to bring up, right, current events, right? Things that they are witnessing, things that they have questions about instead of framing it. And so if we don't know, right, how to do that, then there are steps that we could take um, to really help us get over our own, our own fear and our own discomfort. Because what that transforms into is to ign is into ignorance. And that ignorance really can manifest itself in dangerous ways. And so if we don't know, then what do we do, right? We have ways to find facts, right? We have the ability to find information so quickly, right? It's at our, it's at our fingertips. You know, we can, ask questions, right? Clarifying questions. What do you mean by that? Tell me more. We need to dig deeper, right? We need to think about like, how do we invite people in, right? Instead of calling people out. And that's the hard part because we know that sometimes people say things, people do things, children, young people, when we do workshops with the young people, sometimes they say things, right? Out of sincere, just, just in wanting to understand that may be triggering for us but we have to begin to work through it for their sake. And so we need to start to establish, right, some, some real clear kind of expectations, right, around how we show up, whether it's in school, whether it's at home, right, and what your values are. 
And then to assess yourself, right? Where am I in talking about these things? Honestly, right? Am I comfortable with that? And if not, why is that? Right, and then demonstrating, right? If you say you're a family, right, who believes in social justice, how do you demonstrate that to your young people, right? How do you demonstrate inclusiveness? How do you demonstrate equity, right? Being public about that is so important because again, children are watching what we do, not really what we say. And so involving teachers and family members and community is so key in this because it's a circle, right? And we tend to think of like there's school and then there's community, right? But what we know is that we are interacting and that what happens in the, in the community impacts what's going on in school, what happens in school impacts what's happening in the community. And so we have to get involved. We have to have dialogue with each other, right? Around students' needs, around places where we might be lacking in terms of addressing our own bias or addressing equity or addressing inclusiveness. And so when things happen, next slide, please. The goal for us, right, is to get to the place where we can act as allies, right? To set up a foundation where we're not reactive, but we're proactive. And so the goal really of anti-bias education um, is allyship, right? And allyship implies action. So really being able to move from our safe place, move from our place of discomfort to be brave, to take that risk to be wrong, right? To take that risk, to have that uncomfortable conversation, to take that risk, to share what your experience has been, because we assume that people know our story. We assume that people understand what our experience is, or we assume that they don't, right? So we need to start having the conversation. We need to start building this understanding so we can really start to act as sincere allies. Right. And so more than just right posting on social media, it's getting active, it's doing something. It's developing skills and strategies to address bias in the moment, right? Not after the fact. And then to continuously have those, those kind of practices and policies and things in place so that it doesn't reoccur. And so, you know, in reality, like we're not going to get rid of bias, right? We're not going to just you know, educate ourselves so much that, you know, we're never going to have to deal with this again. But we can, again, we can equip ourselves to deal with this in a proactive way, and we can equip ourselves to deal with this in an impactful way. And I think that's what's most important, is making sure, again, that we equip ourselves, that we equip our young people in doing that, and not shaming folks, right, not making folks feel like they don't belong in the conversation, um, and really championing justice. Next. And so um, through our resources, you know, we have different strategies and things that we share um, for responding to incidents, um, for, um, you know, having conversations around bias and hate and things like that. Um, but there are some quick things that you can do when things happen, right? Because maybe you're in a meeting, maybe you're with a group of parents, maybe you're with a teacher and they say something that is triggering, that is bias, right? And our immediate reaction might be to kind of clam up or to say something, but there's a process, right, in that, that will allow us to keep them in the conversation, right, in a conversation that's productive. And so we use stop, think, feel, act, right, kind of as our course of action and addressing things that happen in the moment. And this is effective because it gives us a time to reflect, right, on where we're coming from. It gives us a time to consider, right, maybe where the other folk, person is coming from and who's in the room, Right, and then it gives us the ability to do something, right? To be intentional about disrupting this behavior and this attitude. And so there are many things that we need to consider as we are thinking about disrupting bias and the escalation of hate, right? But one of the things that we need to do first is really address the bias within ourselves, right? And understand where that's coming from and commit to engaging in, in demonstrating attitudes and behaviors right, that do not perpetuate that bias. And I know it's not an easy feat, but it's necessary. Next. And so how do we do that? Um, through a lot of different ways, um, through our family table talk conversations. Next slide. We also have lesson plans that are available for teachers. Um, we have our books matter corner 
that has hundreds of books on various topics. And so we want to be able to continue to have this conversation with you all. We want you all to get in a place, right, where this doesn't feel uncomfortable, but that it feels natural and that it feels necessary. And so Charlene, I know that we have um, only a few minutes left and you threw some questions out there, but did you have any more questions or things that came up for you? Absolutely. But first, I really want to say thank you, Samantha, for such a brilliant conversation on this topic, that people were commenting how much they appreciated just the fact that we're having this conversation. And as my parent venture partner, Bev Hartman, always says, it is through disequilibrium that we learn and grow. So even though these conversations, as you say, can be hard, they're important. And I think that's why we're here, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you're a parent and you're driving your kiddo from school and they have two friends in the back seat and one of them says something that you think is out of line, what would you do? What should a parent do? I think address it in the moment, right? Address it in the moment and come to come to the conversation from an education um, from an education perspective and also from a realistic from a human perspective and say things like "ouch," like you know that that really feels uncomfortable. That really feels disrespectful. Um, that's really hurtful because of right? And that will allow kids the ability to know that we're not shaming, right? But that we're trying to bring them to a point of awareness and consciousness where they are more respectful. Um, and that's hard to do, right? Because sometimes we're like, these are other people's kids and we don't want to press our values. But I think what we can agree on as parents and educators, right, that we want to, again, create for young people spaces and places that are safe, right, that are inclusive, that are equitable, um, both in, in safe. And when I say safe, I do mean emotionally and physically. Yes. And you mentioned that. And I agree. Teachers are seeing a lot of sort of regressive behavior, more acting out, more violence, more confrontations on the playground. I know I'm a reviewer on Nextdoor and conversations about race devolve almost immediately. Given that people are so reactionary, this parent asks, I'd like to have more conversations with friends and family about race, but it's hard. Do it you is have hard. Suggestions. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard for all of us, right? It's it's kind of the 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 expectation um, many times that like because you're part of X group, right? Because I am, you know, a person of color. That's easy to talk about race, right? And it's not. It is a hard conversation because those are the people that we love. Those are the people that we learn from, right? But put ourselves in a young person's shoes. Would we not have loved for our parents or for those people, right, to, to introduce us to a different perspective? And I think one of the things that we forget as adults is that we're still learning, right? We should be lifelong learners. So it's never a bad idea to educate folks, right? And it's not saying that you're going to convince them that what you're saying is right, because that's not necessarily the goal. The goal is to bring them to a sense of awareness where they understand how their attitudes and behaviors impact other folks. And you know, possibly perpetuate systems of bias. Absolutely. And Bev just put a link to our video library in the chat. Any parents online who are not familiar that we have a very robust library with more than 120 videos free. And there's a whole band of videos on social justice. So please do check that out. Um, we've got just a minute, Samantha. I'm going to ask you for any final thoughts. This is a difficult conversation, but what gives you hope? for the future as a <laughs> education director at such a prestigious organization? Um, you know, it's hard because again, I see the reality, I see the statistics. Um, I think what gives me hope um, is, you know, the willingness of the young people that are in my life, right? To understand, to grow, to know, um, to create for themselves a better world. That definitely gives me hope. Um, that we can change the perspective, we can shift the paradigm, we can shift the culture. Well, I think those are beautiful words to end with and your idea that it's our job as parents to open our kids' eyes to other perspectives really is the whole story. So we are so grateful to you, Samantha Brown and ADL for tonight's conversation. Thank you everybody for joining us. We're really glad to have you with us and we hope to continue the conversation with you soon. Take care, everybody. Stay well, and we'll see you again soon. Good night.